Hey everyone, James Prendamano, CEO of Cassandra Properties. This week with Scott Carson on the Note Closer Show, we take a hard look at some of the opportunities that are going to present themselves next year in the market and how to stay flexible enough to make sure you can take advantage of those opportunities. Looking forward to seeing everyone. This is the Note Closer Show, where you get the latest developments in distressed note investing and learn the secrets of how you can control millions of dollars worth of property for pennies on the dollar. Get educated and entertained by someone who has closed thousands of deals and lives to support you in achieving the same. Now, here's your host, CEO of We Close Notes, Scott Carson. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, everybody. Welcome to this episode of the Note Closure Show. As always, Scott Carson, excited to be here with you today and, and really excited for this episode. Uh, we've got listeners all across the country. We have people listening over 130 countries across this crazy world, uh, the rock, you know, third rock from the sun, they like to say. But one of our biggest audiences is up in the New York area. And I've been looking for somebody who knows that market, who understands what's going on in that market, has been doing it for a while, not a flash of man, but somebody who's really done quite a, an amazing job in the neck of the woods. And so I'm really honored to have our special guest today. He's the CEO for Cassandra Properties. It's Staten Island's premier real estate firm. And for nearly 30 decades, we won't age him, but you have a bit of idea. He started like when he was one. Uh, with his tra trademark enthusiasm, his creativity and leadership, he shepherded the, the completion and transformation of projects, including major initiatives reshaping Staten Island's commercial real estate landscape, also big on the, on the residential side. I was honored to be a guest on his podcast a few weeks ago. And as soon as I we connected online, I was like, I got to have on the Note Closure Show. So I'm so honored to have uh, Mr. James Prendamano on the Note Closure Show today. What's going on, James? How you doing, buddy? That is some intro, Scott. I don't know. Uh, <laughs> that's some, some billing to live up to, but let's give it a shot. Well, hey, it's we 2020. Doing? We're doing good. It's 2020. If you come in a little below, you're fine. <laughs> 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 but you know, you're crazy you, times. It is. It is a crazy time. We were we were chatting a little bit earlier about things and how, how, how chaotic it can be. And uh, you know, we haven't had anybody in to talk about uh, your market up in the woods. Kind of what's going on there. So first, before we dive into that, let's share a little bit about kind of what you focus on and and your kind of. I guess you'd say your bread and butter. Uh, and kind of how you got to where you're at today, huh, James? Sure. So uh, that that's a uh, that question has changed. The answer to that question has changed over the years, right? Sure. I think uh, part of what has been uh, a, a big portion of our success is that we've adapted uh, as the markets have changed. Uh, we found the the company was founded in 1989 by my mom. Uh, she specialized in high end residential homes. Um, not the best of times to go start a brokerage, <laughs> but, uh, you know, she's a trailblazer mom. Uh, she went out there, she, she kind of owned that luxury market. And then she started to see uh, an opportunity for land leasing of all mm -hmm. things back then on Staten Island was almost non-existent. Um, she started to get into the land leasing, uh, marketplace and being a woman in that space at that time on Staten Island was a challenge. Uh, but she really carved out a niche. And, and in many cases, she educated the, the base out here as to how the land leases worked and what the opportunities were there. So over the years, we've really gotten involved in all of it. You know, we've got a really healthy residential component. We've got a very, very strong commercial component. Uh, we do a lot of consulting work. So we've, we've adapted back and forth, but our focus for sure has been the, the large projects and uh, the consulting work, the brokerage, the leasing of the large scale, the more complicated, uh, difficult projects that you've seen out here on, on the borough, we've been proud to, to handle. And we do do stuff off Staten Island. Uh, usually mm -hmm. it's court appointed work. We did a lot of the Walgreens portfolio work uh, and that type of stuff. But uh, that's really our sweet spot is the larger complex uh, transactional stuff, big packages, uh, defaulted note sales, ground up development. That's really where where we kind of hit every note. Well, and that's why I was so glad to have you on here. We talked about some of the bigger stuff out there. And, I, and you and I talked previously about this before. Where we we expect to see some big things happening in that, co that commercial space and that other larger property space or unique space because of everything that's going on. You want to talk about kind of what you're seeing as opportunities maybe in, in your, your neck of the woods right now? Sure. So, you know, it's interesting. The There are still opportunities 
out there, but it's become very difficult to quantify the opportunity in the context of where we are. You know, the, tr the traditional cap rates, very difficult to assess who's paying, who's not paying, even if it's a completely performing center, which is almost non-existent at this point. Uh, you know, there's uh, everyone seems to have different issues throughout the tenancy mix. Uh, but even if it's completely performing, what is that going to mean in a year? What is that going to mean in 18 months as we start to see the second half of the fallout? And that's where I believe, and I believe you, you also agree, that's where the real fallout is going to occur over the next 12 to 18, some are even saying up to 24 months once the, the market you know, gets to that point where the courts open and uh, the stimulus has run out and folks have decentralized, right? And they've kind of up and moved out completely. Mm -hmm. Now what, you know, is a, is a 10 cap, is a 12 cap? I mean, we were, we were excited to get involved in six cap deals, five and a half caps if it was a single tenant asset. Now 10, 12, I don't know, does it make sense anymore? What is it gonna look like in the next year, year and a half? I think, I think that there's the, there are some opportunities, Scott, but I think the majority of the opportunities are still out there. We're recommending to our clients, pull trigger if you have to, if you have tax, uh, tax free exchanges that you're trying to keep in line, uh, or for whatever other reasons you need to move assets, go ahead and do that, but keep some powder dry. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's definitely, we've seen that with a lot of the, the funds there on Wall Street, place. they've been pulling back for the last 24 months, expecting something to change as the market kind of turns. And you guys are in such a unique kind of market, especially legally wise, uh, yeah. you, with the foreclosure process really being on a, a, you know, a slow boat to China, for the most part, yeah. if you think about that, uh, compared to like here in Texas, where everything's so fast and and. That's the way I, when you start seeing these national numbers, you got to break it down on a micro basis. Are there any things that you're looking at? Obviously, vacancy factors, cap rates, stuff like that. But anything that you're kind of watching as kind of your, your bell cow or your mark that you're kind of paying close attention to that it really shows you when things are changing or things are getting tough? Yeah, well, we, we have the traditional metrics, right, that we all kind of take a look at. Um, but What's so different about this, this turn, look, we've been through multiple cycles, right? The market goes up, the market goes down, these things happen. Uh, but what's so different this time is technology has disrupted um, everything we do to such an extent that it's, it's not easy, but it certainly is much easier to look at other marketplaces outside of New York City where the legislative uh, process isn't as difficult and not as threatening, where the legal process certainly uh, is not as difficult. So with that, folks have begun to decentralize as real estate is decentralized, investors are decentralizing, and we don't know when the courts reopen what's going to happen. Right. You know, there's, everyone's in limbo right now. Uh, the, so many of the rights have been shifted. That's been consistent. There's been a consistent shift uh, of rights away from the property owner to the tenant on both the residential and commercial side, believe it or not. Uh, even confessions of judgments now they're throwing out. They're saying that they're not going to stand anymore. There's <laughs> a, yeah, it's, it's, and, and it's, it's become very challenging. So the, you know, I don't want to give your listeners bad advice uh, because there are the traditional metrics that we would look at, but I, I really do believe that you have to wait and see once everything opens back up, how are these things going to play out? How many people are not coming back to the city mm -hmm. proper and who's going to backfill that space? I do believe that we're going to have an opportunity to backfill. I do believe that there'll be new markets that are going to open up. Uh, I do believe that micro logistics centers and, and stuff in the M zone uh, is going to absolutely continue to explode. But what do you mean by the M zone, James? So the M zone is uh, we have uh, 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 1978, I think it was the last time the, the zoning code was updated in New York. So we have uh, each piece of property has a zoning classification and okay. you can only build within those classification. So M property, which for a long time languished because nobody was manufacturing up okay. here in New York. Uh, and it was, you could, you could have picked up M zones for a couple of bucks a foot. Uh, now, as we're seeing Amazon and the, you know, the focus on last mile on a host of different uh, supply chains, right? 
uh, micro logistics centers are starting to pop up, storage facilities, cold storage facilities. Uh, these distribution centers now are coming into, I don't want to say center city, but into the cities in a meaningful way where that market segment's continuing to explode, whereas the residential stuff is certainly pulled back. The retail stuff is really pulled back. But if you have M property, we're bullish as we've ever been. We think that that's poised for continued growth for the foreseeable future. Yeah, we've seen started to see some things pivot on uh, manufacturing, but also like Amazon looking at coming and taking over old malls, you know, retail, yeah. large retail centers that are basically vacant now that nobody's going to, you know, they expect 50% of malls across the country not to recover, you know, and that's a great opportunity. We even, I, I even saw a company buy a mall and turn it into a SWAT center for police training because it's a great kind of, you know, with the different shops and different things to do live target practice with live rounds in a mall you got to get a little creative and stuff like that but that's i think you you're, you're hit the nail right in the head that manufacturing and those companies are looking to downsize or have a little bit more availability in smaller units kind of like what blockbuster did initially or best buy did initially with the uh um the machines in the malls blockbuster minis you know what i mean or having it be a small store versus such a big big box store right yeah, so uh, it's it's interesting because we're having a lot of discussions now with the administration uh, and the powers that be centered around precisely that. It's time for us to reimagine our real estate in every way from top down. Um, and I have to say to, to that end, the city's been very responsive and has pulled together um, officials from each different arm up here. And we're brainstorming on what what does the, the these what do these assets look like, mm -hmm. you know, after Corona? How how can we reposition? And I think the most important thing that we could be doing up here is pulling back some of those old zoning codes that were put in place in a different time and a different era. If you think about how technology has disrupted every single industry over the last 15 to 20 years, and then you apply it to the zoning, which is what allows us to uh, envision and create real estate in the greatest city in the world. That hasn't changed much, right? It's time that we pull those layers back. And I think we have to really start to reimagine what M zone means, what C zones mean, what the R zones mean. And uh, the world's changing, brother. We've got to change with it. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And that's one thing that I've seen. That if you've seen a lot of the, the residential stuff, especially in Staten Island, really start to skyrocket as people moved out of the city, jumped on the ferry and come across uh, you know, you've seen we, those probably prices really jump up or days on market probably drop dramatically, huh? We have, uh, Staten Island is, you know, the forgotten borough, right? It's always kind of been known as the forgotten borough where we're a part of New York City, um, but we've always kind of lagged behind. And it's, it's really great uh, silver linings, I guess. The one takeaway in that perspective is Staten Island has now become the chosen borough. People are, you know, we're the borough of parks. We've got some wonderful places out here that uh, are now folks are, are waking up and saying, wow, you know, I can sell in, in Brooklyn my 13 foot wide townhouse for a million seven, a million eight. Uh, and I can come out to Staten Island and buy a beautiful on a 50 by 100, uh, you know, a, a detached center hall colonial and uh, have my own little nice slice of heaven here, put 800 grand in the bank or reinvest it into other assets. Um, we have seen everything you just said, days on market come down, uh, listing prices are going up um, and deals are, are moving with uh, a, a really healthy velocity. The absorption's down. Everything in Staten Island has been trending in the right way. The rest of the city, it's been tough. It's been mm -hmm. tough. Now, knowing your kind of background, uh, let's talk a little about some of your background in the note business. Uh, talk about some of the things that you've done in the past there. And, I'm, and I'm, I'm, I'm setting that up because I want to ask a follow-up question on that. So share a little bit with our listenership some of the things that you've done in the past when it comes to the distressed debt side. Sure. So uh, in, in the past, uh, again, as we've kind of been a chameleon and we've adapted into whatever uh, trend we thought was on the horizon back in, I think it was 2006, actually, uh, we had come back to the office. I was with a business partner. I'll never forget it. And we looked at each other and we said, it's over. It's over. We felt it in 2006. This wow. is done. Uh, and real estate, of course, reports two, three, four quarters down the road, especially in New York. Uh, but a couple of years before the bubble officially burst, um, we had said, let's start to 
hone our skills, let's whiteboard what we think this is going to look like on the other side. And of course, the faulted notes was where uh, we knew that was headed. There was a lot of banks that were credit card lenders one day, and then they were full blown <laughs> lending institutions the next, you know, yeah. um, and you, you could kind of jot down the names on a short list that, that you thought were going to be headed for trouble. And that's what we did. And we started to cultivate relationships with those banks. And when it came time to move those notes, you know, we became experts in it, you know, mm -hmm. not on your scale, not anywhere near your scale, <clears throat> but you know, for us, especially out here in Staten Island, a defaulted note for 20, $30 million that, you know, wrapped a, a host of different assets out here in the borough was a big deal. So mm -hmm. we focused on that for a couple of years. And then as we saw, you know, things starting to change again, it became, all right, so now what are we going to do with the product? How are we going to reposition it? Is it going to be long-term cap rate plays? Or are we going to do a uh, condo, a co-op plays and, and have, you know, a disposition plan? Is it going to be a hybrid thereof? So we started to move through that as well. And, you know, one thing leads to another, you know, what happens, you know, yeah. when you're in the business, you, you have a way through vertical integration to kind of get involved in different synergistic businesses. CapEx funding is our commercial uh, lending arm. We have a very healthy consulting company, uh, the residential and commercial, of course, and the real estate side. And now we're doing work in the cost confinement space for companies that are skinnying up and property owners that are skinnying up. So, you know, Cassandra is the mothership, but as the markets evolve, you, you kind of evolve with it and vertically integrate where you can. Yeah. So that's, that leads to the follow up question because you're very familiar in a lot of these areas and have been flexible. And we, and I guess, I guess the one biggest thing, those that stick around long term versus just an upward trend are those are the most that, that can pivot or find the opportunities really kind of ahead of time. You guys talked, you talked about a couple of things there. You, what do you kind of put in place here for once things shake loose? I, mean, I don't want you to give away any secret sauce, but if you've got some things that you're keeping your eye on that you think are going to be really advantageous there in your neck of the woods, would you mind sharing? Sure. So what we're doing at this point is uh, on our own portfolio and for our clients, as I had said, we're divesting from certain asset classes. Um, that have experienced contraction for a number of reasons, um, not limited to the traditional metrics, right? Mm -hmm. Their legislative threats, uh, Scott, have become a massive, massive part of our decision tree on everything we do now. The legislation is coming out fast and furious. Um, while it's all well-intended, uh, sometimes the consequences are so profound that they're setting entire asset classes back mm -hmm. significantly. So we're looking to move out of some of the uh, multifamily space. We're looking to move out of some of the retail space, not all of it, but some of it. And uh, we're keeping some of the powder dry. We're moving into opportunity zones and we're doing incubators in those buildings where uh, if you could you know, get, wrap your head around getting out of trading bricks for bricks, we want to start trading bricks for human capital and talent. Mm -hmm. uh, so, you know, we're excited about a program where through a QOF, a qualified opportunity fund, uh, we're taking some of that gain uh, from those capital events. And again, we're rebuilding new bricks, better, smarter bricks. Uh, but we're also holding a piece back to invest in our incubators uh, to grab some of these uh, younger kids that have unbelievable ideas and spirit and energy. Uh, and we want to invest in them and in their companies and help provide, you know, a roof over their head, infrastructure, high-speed internet, mentorship, of course, uh, and capital uh, to give them a chance to grow. Uh, and then we're also holding back, you know, we're keeping some of the powder dry as the, the courts open again. Um, you know, we think that there's going to be, look, as the deposits are shifting within the banks, right? You know, uh, I, I was on a call the other day and I heard, I think it was Wells Fargo was offering a half a million dollars, I believe it was, for a discount of like a quarter of a point. If you moved a half a million bucks into their bank, right? They would discount your mortgage that, that amount further. Don't quote me on the number, but it was yeah. something along those lines. So what's happening is the big boys are going, bring the deposits in, we're gonna stay whole, right? We'll remain solvent and compliant, but that money's coming from somewhere. Mm -hmm. And it tends to come from those smaller to mid cap banks. And as those deposits get pulled out, as you are well aware, they fall out of compliance and they have more debt on their books than they can. So what happens at that point, right? They have to get rid of it. Mm -hmm. And that's where we think uh, there's gonna be a massive amount of opportunity, not the huge defaulted note 
markets like it was last time around, I think in that two, three, five, eight, nine million dollar range, there's going to be a, a, a massive, massive amount of opportunity. Yeah, that's uh, that's the biggest stuff. You know, that's the biggest price point. That's really uh, opportunity wise out there is that sub 10 million, really anything 5 million and below. We see a lot of that's what's been financed by your traditional banks and the bigger stuff has all been gobbled by Wall Street. And it's just a change of, of oh, zeros and ones. Yep. And I love that transfer stuff. But I love what you said about being changing your traditional brick and mortar aspect, taking a business and converting it to a, uh, you know, like an executive office or providing you know, a place for people to come individually to have that professional setting where they don't have to have the whole building or whole lease stuff. They can do something and you give them the resources to be to accelerate and then also investing in what they're doing. That's a phenomenal. I love that aspect of things because there is so much talent coming out right now. And so with technology really changing the way you have to do business these days. I love, I love that stuff, man. That's kudos to you, James, for thinking ahead like that. Yeah. And if you, if you set it up properly in the opportunity zones, um, not the income, the income is taxed, of course, as any income would be. But if you, if you keep it there, and of course, I would recommend speak to your Opportunity Zone experts. There's some yep. wonderful uh, experts out there. But if you keep the business uh, in that location or in an Opportunity Zone for 10 years, and you hit on the next Google or the next Twitter or the next Snapchat, and you sell it for hundreds of millions of dollars, it's tax-free. Mm-hmm. It's tax-free. <clears throat> Those are investments that I think are worthwhile. We're not saying 50% of the portfolio, but if you're selling, uh, you're trading out of bricks, take 10%, take 20% and invest it there. We think it's, it's absolutely well worth it. That's, that's smart thinking. Now, I want to throw something out there. You talked about legislation and with everything uh, going on at the presidential level, we know things don't change overnight there. If you know, B- Biden's got a tax plan that he's talking about doing away with 1031 exchanges, I don't think it'll go through, but you brought something up. I, uh, we were talking with a, a 1031 expert just the other day, and I think this is very relevant because the price points in where you're at fall into that, not only on the residential side, but also on the, obviously on the commercial side that if you are trying to move something, get doing away with a 1031 exchange is going to cause a stagnation on a lot of sales, don't you think? It is, and it's going to require um, all of us to start to reinvent how we shelter those gains. Ergo, the opportunity zone, right? Mm-hmm. That was one of our avenues. I think basis swaps become yep. uh, really, really, really popular if, in fact, they do get rid of the 1031. I hope they don't. I think that um, you know, of all the times in the country's history that we cannot afford that type of a blow to the industry, I think that would be really ill-timed to take that tool away at this point. Yeah, I, I agree to their whole, that's where we think a lot of the deferred sales trust or owner finances are going to come into play for a lot of those commercial properties to kind of de- delay those tax, you know, those long-term or, uh, or this capital gains taxes that people are going to see. You know, it's a, it's such an interesting, such an interesting dumpster fire every year. I mean, but with every type of thing, even with fires, there's a fertile ground for a lot of opportunities out there with things going on. You know, uh, you just got to be flexible, looking at different opportunities there for you. Um, are you guys looking at anything outside of your area, any other states or anything like that, or just trying to stay home right now in the Empire so State? We're definitely gearing up to operate out of state. Uh, again, the legislative challenges and the courts. Um, have become become particularly difficult to continue to operate, you know, and, and the, you know, the taxes, you know, it was yeah. still getting hit, right? You know, it's, it's very tough to, and I look, I understand certainly the, the reasons behind the shutdowns and, and at least the thought process behind it. But when you, when you require someone to shut down their business um, and then you hit them with a tax bill <laughs> and, you know, it's, there's no abatement on the tax bill and you don't require banks to give uh, forbearance, uh, that becomes really difficult to manage, right? So I think that people, New York's always gonna be New York. I really do believe that. I think that when it does rebound, it's gonna rebound with an unbelievable ferocity, the likes of which we've never seen. But uh, it is becoming easier to operate out of state. And uh, I recently met this really dynamic guy out of Texas who specializes in defaulted notes. So um, I'm hoping to be doing business with him (laughs) in a meaningful way in the near future. (laughs) 
<laughs> exactly. You're my plan, baby. <laughs> <laughs> gotcha. Just no problem at all. We got plenty of people like, hey, show me the money. Even show me the deals. Yeah, Definitely. Exactly. Now, uh, you mentioned uh, doing some things. And was it you have a fund you started called CapEx? Is that correct? Is that, that's that? our commercial lending arm. So that's the uh, non-QM field mortgages where we're doing the financing. Can, do you, can you talk a little bit what you guys are approving, what you're kind of seeing right now as far as what you're, you're financing? Yeah. So right now, uh, the big thing is SBA, uh, you know, where you have uh, tenants in buildings where uh, perhaps they hadn't previously contemplated making the purchase because the rates are so low and because the programs have gotten so flexible on SBA. I have to say, SBA has done an unbelievable job adapting here. Uh, we are finding that we're able to convert renters into owners, which is, which is great. Um, but outside of that, we, we are still financing deals. We just closed a retail deal last week, uh, but it's challenging the discount rates that they're applying uh, to the appraisals and to the rents, even for the tenants that are performing. And I get it. You know, there's the traditional metrics are, are out the window at this point. It becomes difficult. The LTVs become so egregious that right. uh, you have to pull back a bit. The, the private money is as hot as it's ever been, yeah. right? As the banking restrictions increase and, and they become less flexible, that need for that private money becomes more and more and more relevant. So we're seeing a lot of, of things happen transactionally there. A lot of SBA stuff, some refinances. Um, but short of that, it, to, the traditional lending metrics have been very difficult. Well, as far as uh, what I want to ask you is, where have you seen the LTVs dropping down? To? Obviously, we know cap rates have changed and NOIs and all stuff affects the the true value of a commercial property different than a residential property or rental property. We all know that's differently. But we all knew the banks were getting kind of greedy up in the mid 60s, even 70 percent range. Are you seeing it down in the 50s now, the low 60s, or even below that? Yeah. So if you're not if you're not in a space where your tenants are hospitals or medical, uh, or you're not in the M space, uh, where you've got trucking companies, storage companies, logistic companies, uh, short of those two markets, all of them are down, mm -hmm. quite honestly. The LTVs, and they're right where you're, you're saying 50, 60 percent, you know, nobody is excited about 70, 80 percent anymore. It's yeah. just a thing of the past. It'll be interesting to see. Uh, how some of these uh, these things shake out and how some of these lenders, the CMBS lenders in particular, um, because some of those programs were so aggressive uh, and those funds all have these springing, you know, power of attorneys where if there's a default, they now are in control of it. And yeah. I think they're kind of sitting around going, Ooh, you know, we don't, we don't want to be in control of all these properties. <laughs> that's, that's not where we make money. It know? was a great, it was a great idea on the front and not such a good idea. Now it's, it's, a, it's the whole same thing that happened with banks and the, the default on the, the real estate. They didn't want to manage property and vacant homes. You know, they wanted the, the performing stuff, which is all the banks want anyway, you know? Yeah. <laughs> not as easy as everyone thinks, right? No. Well, but that's also leads to an opportunity with, if you can be creative and, and structure deal with owner financing, like you said, bringing in a private lender, maybe in a mezzanine, you know, short term and short term is a whole different ball game. Now, short term is two to four, two to five years really versus yeah. 12 months to carry that paper till the market rebounds. If you find an opportunity, it's just a matter of, that's why you said having that drive, you know, that extra money sitting on the sidelines ready to spring on a deal that makes sense and, and the ability to get creative. Uh, if something's going to make sense or transition. I think that's the, I think that's the one biggest thing. And I think you agree with this is if you're transitioning, how are they evaluating that, tr that property transitioning? You know, we saw a, uh, a office space convert to self storage in downtown Denver it was an interesting play 110 units. Yep. And it got bought up for $560,000 in a cap rate. Mm -hmm. When I looked at the numbers, I was like, Oh my God. And then talking to the seller, and I'm like, really, office? I would think is is a little tough downtown. He goes, no, he goes, it is for office. But what we did is we turned it to self storage, and we reached out to all the offices closing, and they're the all who rented with us. We filled up in like a week <laughs> with well, office furniture, basically. I'm glad you brought that that deal up because that's a perfect example of what we're dealing with up here now. So there there has been multiple deals that we were involved in, some that that closed and some that died, and I'll explain why. Uh, where they were taking these buildings uh, where the tenancy wasn't there anymore and they were converting them into self-storage. Big returns. They take that, they sell it on the secondary market. Yeah. You get wonderful money at the end of the day. This year in the budget, the governor cut the ICAP 
uh, for self-storage buildings. So there's no longer a tax abatement available. So where there was this uh, suffering uh, product, right, in the office spaces, the vacancies are up. Again, I've been talking about the decentralization of real estate for yeah. years. Um, in comes the self-storage, people reinvent themselves. Great, this is a, a nice, easy transition. Deals start to happen. The governor pulls it out of the budget. Deals start dying all over the place because the taxes here are so egregious. Mm -hmm. You can't make them work anymore. So again, if there's ever been an opportunity or a time when I would call upon the legislature to continue to, to focus on pulling some of those things back and, and allowing the market to kind of find its own level when you, when you tweak those little things and you turn those dials because it looks good on the balance sheet and you, know, you can recapture that tax base, the impact is so profound and so 10x, 20x more devastating when the deal never happens, right? And the buildings lay fallow and there's no one paying taxes. There's nobody paying uh, their employees. Those employees are not now going out and eating, right? All of those things that, that the waterfall is immense on a transaction like that. It's tough. It is tough. You know, and speaking of tough, I think I've got a buddy who's taking hotels, you know, smaller 100 unit, you know, 200 unit, or less hotels and converting them to multifamily in areas that need affordable housing. And I, that's my next question for you. You know, the hotel industry obviously has been hit dramatically affected up in, in New York City and all over the place. Are you seeing uh, maybe some of those opportunities, some of the things pop up where uh, distressed hotels or stuff being closed a little bit more so? Yeah, well, without a doubt, some of the hotels made deals with the city um, and they're handling the homeless population now. So they've been able to stay solvent uh, during the shutdown in that manner. But those who uh, either elected not to participate or were not able to participate for a number of different reasons, they're in trouble. Uh, again, a great example of repurposing the real estate. But again, because of the complexities of the zoning here, it's not as simple as, uh, you know, I'm sure down in San Antonio or in some other districts, it is a very, very long, difficult process to try and operate outside of the prescribed zoning. Uh, and I think that that is an immediate need that has to get addressed where there's an emergency panel. Uh, I sit on, uh, on the mayor's um, advisory group to address these kinds of things. Um, and I'm hopeful that we can get to some sort of resolution there because we, the, the flexible zoning and emergency zoning, I think is an absolute must to help the, the city rebound. Yeah, good stuff there. Now, one of the things that you've you've done this year too is launch your podcast, and I absolutely love what you're doing with the podcast. Look at look at you. If you, you're listening to this, you could not see the megawatt bulb that just went off with James smiling right now, talking about the podcast. Let's talk a little about that because you've done you do such a great job. You're really doing a great job not only marketing it but your social media stuff is second to none out there. Let's talk about the podcast and what made you kind of decide to, to launch one and then kind of your focus with that. Sure. So thank you for that. Um, this is very, very, very far out of my comfort zone. So I've never been, uh, I've always been a head down guy, just go, go to work and put your 14, 15, 16 hours in a day, grind it out. And I, I never uh, worked on this side of the business. Um, we, we began with business coaching and we began, you know, forcing ourselves to get out of our comfort zones, quite honestly. And Peter, um, my CMO for the company, uh, who had previously worked for Apple said, Hey, you know, there's a whole other side of this thing here. You know, real estate is as much about marketing today as it is about being a deal maker, maybe more mm -hmm. about marketing than it is about being a deal maker. Uh, so, you know, we had made the commitment and when COVID hit, um, everything was delivered. We said, let's go in and, and finish the studio up. Let's get it ready to go. And it became for us, honestly, a really personal thing. We needed to give the folks a platform to communicate, you know, uh, a lot of frustration, uh, a lot of stories in the local business community that uh, we needed to get out. It took off you know, much faster than I honestly it took off more than I ever thought it would, never mind much faster than it, I thought it would. And I give full credit to Peter for that. Peter Gambino, our CMO, brilliant guy, uh, has really changed how we do things here. Uh, and, and it became, like I said, personal. It was a way for us to help connect the dots and to give an audience to folks who otherwise didn't have it and to get that message out there and to communicate, Scott. There's nothing more important today than communication. 
Yeah, that's that's one of the biggest things that we found too with this year being so unique is it just one thing is the need for us to touch base. Sometimes we get so bogged down in our day to day, like, you know, working at our desk. It's nice to have you, you can't meet in person and share a beer or a cup of coffee. You can share an hour or a half hour online and, and have that personal interaction. But the, the venting side, I agree to that. Sometimes people just need a place to vent their frustration and how they're feeling to express and realize that they're not alone these days more so than anything else. Right. Yeah. W- without a doubt, we're, you know, we're all in this boat together. Um, and it doesn't matter if you're a new business or, you know, we've been here, like I said, 1989, we've been through the nine 11s and the, 08 crash, Superstorm Sandy, which was devastating for Staten yeah. Island. We've been through the stress tests, but um, in the moment, you you feel like you need to connect. And mm-hmm. that's been something that we take a lot of pride in. We've been connecting and connecting our peers with, with an audience they otherwise wouldn't have had access to. And it's really been a great experience for us. What's What's been the biggest surprise for you since you launched? How much I enjoy it, quite honestly. <laughs> I promise you, it, it's, you know, it, it was so far out of my comfort zone. I felt, how am I going to get on and talk for an hour? And how am I going to, you know, carry a, a broadcast in that way? Uh, and and I've, I've fallen into it and I've really fallen in love with it. I, I enjoy the podcast so much. I look forward to them uh, every week. And anytime I have an opportunity to come on a show like this, we're so appreciative to, to be able to connect and get that message out. That is without a doubt, my biggest surprise is how we, all of us, we've all just kind of fallen in love with it. It's a, it's a wonderful tool for us. Yeah. Your whole team does a great job. Kudos to Rebecca, Rebecca out there as well, uh, out there doing a great job. What is, uh, with everything going on, James, and this is a, a, kind of taking away from business, the person, what are you doing to kind of, what do you do at night besides hiding, you know, elves on the shelves for your kids at night? What are you doing to relax a little bit? <laughs> everything going so crazy so uh i enjoy the country i enjoy to 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 get out and to fly fish um that's kind of my my passion i enjoy to you know get out and touch with nature we've got a place up in honesdale pennsylvania Mm -hmm. don't get there often uh but when i do you know reconnecting with the earth we've got cows and chickens and goats and um that's You're a goat farmer. I didn't know you were a goat farmer. There we go. Yeah, baby. <laughs> Absolutely. You know, for me, that's it. Uh, a lot of families, we, we joke around, like to go during the downtime and put their feet in the sand and to relax. Not us. We, we like to get in the mud and play with the animals. And uh, I don't know, there's something that's so therapeutic about it for us. Uh, the whole family really enjoys it. Yeah, there's definitely something to be said around different animals and getting, getting a little dirt under your fingernails and, and getting dirty and those that yeah. have experienced it it's 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 something to be said about that it's definitely there's an energy that flows in the ground i mean you know i live in north north austin texas here we've got down a very big backyard but we've turned it into our own tropical forest and it's the nice thing every morning first thing getting up go outside just walking enjoying it trying to step away from all the negativity in the news out that's taking place out there and I, that, that kind of brings me to the question. with everything that's going on in the media what would you say? I just want to know your opinion. I know you probably have a strong opinion with what we see. And I will say on all the networks, how much of it do you think was what the reporting is going on up in your guys' neck of the woods is actually accurate? Can we be more specific? There's so okay. many topics. I so yeah, I, I get that. So let's do, let's do one thing. Let's talk about uh, COVID because I know New York city was hit hard initially. And, but I've got friends that are nurses, uh, you know, head nurses in ER rooms saying they've got a lot of empty beds. They're only seeing a few cases here and there. Do you think the media is really over exaggerating the situation up in New York? I mean, you had the, 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 the boat that came in, the big ship that left that really didn't use and stuff like that. Do you think it's overblown yeah. over the neck of the woods? Yeah. So look, somehow, somewhere along the way, um, you know, we, thankfully, we, I think we dodged a big bullet here. I think that if this was um, as fatal as we had originally thought it was, um, good Lord, were we not prepared? Uh, right. So I, I I understand the hesitation and the desire for the powers that be to make sure we don't get to a critical mass issue in our hospitals, right? And uh, for as many cases as I can tell you about folks who I knew who got sick and who really got sick, I can tell you about cases where people 
had no clue they had it. And mm-hmm. only through all of these testing efforts did we find out that they did have it. Le- literally zero symptoms. So uh, I, I think it's a wicked bug. I think we all have to do our part. Um, but I do think that uh, there comes a point where the cure surpasses uh, the ailment. And that, mm-hmm. that's not meant to be disrespectful to anyone who's lost anyone through COVID. Right. Um, but there is an other side to this. And you know, for those of us who have dedicated our lives to our businesses and uh, they, you know, folks don't realize, they think, oh, well, uh, James, he, he may be a greedy business owner talking that way. We have so many people that depend on us, yep. so many families that depend on us, um, that it's not us, it's, it's our extended family. And it, you know, it's been difficult to keep the wheels turning in New York to begin with. It's a very expensive place to operate. And, and when you layer something like this on top of it and forced closures, it's tough. You know, mm-hmm. I, I think that toning down uh, the level of reporting probably would serve us all well. I don't think that we're all so connected now, Scott, you know, any critical information we can access uh, right um, immediately through a, a host of different mediums. Uh, so toning it down, I, I think, honestly, <clears throat> stepping that rhetoric down would serve us all well at this point. I think, I think not only because it's, it's been overreported, I think that it's created COVID fatigue. I think that there's a lot of folks that have let their guard down, even with the basic safety things that we all should follow, because they're just exhausted on it, man. Mm-hmm. It's on every channel. It's on every app. It's, it's, it's so in your face that people are kind of tired of it at this point. And that's dangerous. You know, yeah. we have to stay vigilant. So yeah, I think we would all be served well if, if things got toned down a bit. Good stuff. Favorite New York sports team. I always love asking this question and you can pick a couple if you need to one across the sports. That is very tough for me. So I'm a diehard Giants fan and I'm a diehard Yankees fan. So there you go. Those are my two, my two top teams without a doubt. You know, it might be interesting to see how, who wins the NFC East this year with four or five wins. You know what I mean? And the Giants are in first place right now. Surprise, surprise. (laughs) This, this coach, Joe judge guy comes in first year head coach, a veteran, giving him a hard time, you know, Golden Tate, he goes and he sends him down to the practice squad. To me, that's leadership, brother. Yep. That is in this market with the media frenzy when something like that happens. I love everything that he's doing. I'll take another losing season if that's the way the team is headed. I absolutely love it. Yeah, exactly. So it'll be interesting to see. We might need to place a little bet um, because I'm such a big Cowboys fan. So. Uh. <laughs> Oh, 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 don't hold it against me now brother but that's all right oh, thanks to jason garrett brother we're loving him over here he's got wayne gallman looking like gail sayers i don't know what the heck's happened but it's amazing yeah you know uh garrett you know garrett was actually what well, do you play cowboy he played quarterback for the giants for a couple years there too if i remember correctly yeah, yeah. ivy league education yeah. it's amazing what happens when you can actually do something with it which was being controlled by the gm or the owner for a little bit <laughs> that's a whole yeah. other <laughs> whole other thing out there oh, yeah. so good stuff there well james what's the best way for our listeners and people watching this or, or listening to the replay of this the best way to reach out to you find out more what you're doing listen to what you, you know the podcast stuff like what's the best way to for people to get hold of you you could find basically everything through our website right www.cassandraproperties.com also my email uh you know i am not accessible it's james at cassandraproperties.com um certainly uh always available happy to to get on and chat and uh you know this has been I, I absolutely love chatting with you. I have to say, you've got uh, a way about you that that uh, brings out the best in in the Cassandra Properties family, brother. So <laughs> this has really been great. Hey, you know what? I appreciate that. Same here, man. Uh, it's it's always nice to get on the phone, you know, phone and, and Zoom here with somebody. And and I, you said something that was really Im- impactful a, a couple of minutes ago. People don't realize how many people that entrepreneurs and business owners affect. You know, not only the, our employees but our vendors and their family and our clients and our tents. I mean, we are our own GDP of some sort affecting so many more things out there. And people don't realize that a lot of the difficult decisions that we have to make that keep us up at night. And uh, it's, it's one of the best things I have found about the podcast is being able to you know, connect with like-minded individuals who are also facing those things. And who are putting in those 14 and 16 hour days when nobody else thinks, Oh, you're probably just working six or seven and chilling, you know, having a, a bottle of scotch and a good cigar. No, not, not, not the case. A lot of times. 
you, you would have a hard time quantifying how many times I've disappointed my wife. I've missed an event. I wasn't there for something that I should have and promised I would be. Um, the, those are the things you don't hear about yeah. on, on our side of the table that are really difficult to quantify um, and why we get so passionate when there's a situation like this where there's forced shutdowns and, and these types of things. You know, we've put so much of our life into our business that, um, you know, it's an emotional process. It really is. Yeah, well, that's, that's the beautiful thing. Behind us, there are very powerful women and strong women who allow us to do what we do and keep us on, on track. And uh, that's why the holidays is such a, a great time to spend time with the family and, and, and show the loved ones that we love them and respect them and go from there. I'm sure you've got big plans for the holidays, huh? Yeah, well, with, with the restrictions, again, it's, it's tough, um, yep. you know, but my wife uh, has been an unbelievable partner for me over the years. Um, and, and allowed me and, and really beyond allowed me, she's encouraged me to go out and get it and do what I do. So uh, we're looking forward to some quiet time, uh, you know, around the holidays with the kids and the family and, uh, you know, get ready to jump on into 2021, baby. It's going to be a ride. Yes, sir. It is definitely. Well, James, thanks so much for coming on the Note Closure Show. Uh, thank you so much for just delivering and being honest and, and delivering uh, to our audience out there. And once again, guys, I highly encourage you to check out the Cassandra Properties uh, website, his podcast, listen to his guests, go on, go over, give him a five-star review as well, and hit the subscribe button. It's one of the ones that I subscribed to recently and love listening to. And, and uh, always educational, always a nugget takeaway from that as well. So James, once again, thanks so much for coming on the show. Thank you so much. I appreciate it. Stay safe. You too. All right, guys, that's going to wrap it up for this episode of the Note Closure Show. One thing I think you'll take away from James is the, the, the reason and the necessity to be flexible in your investments and what you're looking at, looking to the future, not just staying stagnant and where you're at and being all shucks, but looking at opportunities in the market, in the future, in people, um, and, and, learn, and figuring out a way to pivot that. Keep some powder dry, as you like to say. So you've got the opportunity to pull the trigger to take advantage of an amazing deal or, or jump into a deal that maybe you don't see very often. So go out, take some action, buddy, and we'll see you all at the top, everybody. Bye.